We've been in a series talking about this idea of like how to be with people. I think for some of us, you need to know the offense that you've had. God sees that. God sees the injustice. God sees that it wasn't your fault. God sees that it wasn't your mess. God sees that you got roped into this. He sees the good, the bad, and the ugly. The art of being forgiving people creates a certain kind of world. And you and I get to choose to do that. Like, how are you feeling today? Excited? Oh, that's good. Listen, I know some of y'all are feeling good because y'all are lively. Like, you had 60 seconds to talk to each other, and I could hear you backstage during the videos. Like, y'all are still having conversations. So that's good. I'm glad that you're hyped this morning. My question for you, though, is about that feeling. That feeling that you said when I said name it, whatever that thing was that came to mind, does it have anything to do with the people that you're with? Does that have anything to do with the people maybe that you're sitting by or that you got a text from this morning? On the flip side, is there anybody who's feeling some kind of way today because of you? Okay, hey. See, that's the question that we're going to look at this morning. That's the question that I want you to think about this morning. How do people feel when they're with you? And more specifically, do people feel joy? Do people feel joy when they're with you. See, I think some of us are missing our joy and it is affecting our relationships. We rub off on people, right? Have you ever been in a relationship with somebody, maybe a friendship long enough that they rub off on you? You start to act like them. You pick up their, maybe their weird way they talk with their hands, their mannerisms, their catchphrases. All of a sudden you're like, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because you've been saying this, right? Because we rub off on people and we do the same things with our emotions. We take our emotions with us into our relationships, and sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's good. There are people that we like to be around. We want them to rub off on us, because we're like, oh, you energize me. I feel uplifted when I'm around you. That's good. But then there are people that you're like, not only do I want you to not rub off on me, I don't want you to touch me, okay? Actually, when I'm with you, there's no joy. It's just like, blech. Like, you just drain me. They just suck the life out of you. They take everything that you have. Do you guys know people like this? Don't point to them. Right? We rub off on each other. So let me ask you again. Which of those people are you? How do people feel when they're with you? And is it possible that we can feel joy or that we can have joy regardless of what we're feeling? See, I don't even know how to phrase that question because we don't even know what joy is. Even though there are all kinds of people that have researched and studied this, there's like a science of joy and a biology of joy and a physiology of joy and a psychology of joy and there's probably some other ologies of joy that I'm just not aware of. But even still, we're not sure what it is. Is it a noun? Is it a verb? Is it something we're supposed to have? Or is it something that we're supposed to do or be? So let's actually start with scripture. Let's look at what the Bible says about joy. In Galatians 5, it says this, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. See, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. So if you consider yourself a Christian, this is the thing that should be produced in your life. Joy should be visible evidence of the invisible Holy Spirit at work in your life. And we know that we're supposed to look for evidence of things. We understand that if somebody feels a certain way, then we should see it. There should be some kind of outward um, resemblance to that. But we look for, I think, evidence of happiness Instead, are they smiling? Are they laughing? Are they actually putting on hard pants and leaving their house? Are they being social? What does their Instagram feed look like? How about their stories? 
Because, you know, stories don't last forever. They're only there for 24 hours, then they go away. We look for evidence of these things. But let me ask you, have you ever smiled when you weren't happy? Have you ever laughed when something wasn't funny? You know, somebody says something, maybe it's your boss, and you have to be like, ha, 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 ha. Don't do it now. I can tell the difference. <laughs> but we do. We've been told that happiness is a right. It's a thing that we should fight for. And so we do. We save up for happiness. We save up our days from work so that we can go somewhere fun. We save up all of our money so that we can buy something that makes us happy. We save up all of our social energy for the people that make us happy because we put our happy in whatever the next thing is. As if there can't be happy in every day, but happy has to be special, and so we have to throw it off onto whatever the next thing is that is going to bring our happiness. The next vacation, the next relationship, because we thought it was that one, but then apparently it wasn't. The next big purchase, the next weekend, right? We work for the weekends. We throw our happiness on to the next thing as if the now is not worthy of having it. But what happens when those things don't come? What happens when there's not enough money to get something extra? Some of you are like, I barely have money right now just to make it through life. I'm already sacrificing. What are you talking about? Extra money for the next thing. Sometimes there is no next traveling experience or a next new thing. And maybe if it's not the money, it's because you can't go anywhere because you're sick or someone else is sick or someone needs you or there's a pandemic that will not allow the world to open back up. Maybe you can't put your happiness in that next relationship because you did and that person left and maybe you don't even know why and as much as you tried to understand and as much as you tried to reconcile and as much as you tried to say, hey, I want to work this out and I'm sorry and I want to just get back the love and connection that we had, it's not there anymore and your happiness went with it. The difference between happiness and joy is the difference between the next and the now. See, happiness says, pursue what's next. But I think God wants us to possess joy now. See, joy is available now no matter what situation you're in. It's bigger than happiness. And let me say this for those of you that are rolling your eyes. This is not toxic positivity. Okay, this is not what we're talking about today. Joy is much bigger than that as well. This is not happy, clappy, pray it away, have more faith, just choose to look on the bright side, everything will be fine. That's like fake optimism. That's not what we're talking about right now. Joy is going to be bigger than anything you're feeling. Remember, joy is a fruit, and that matters. That matters because what that means is it can grow. And what that means is it can be cultivated. Now, I don't do a lot of gardening. I don't do a lot of chores at all, if I'm being honest. <laughs> Yay for my husband, who just, who just said amen, thank you. But I do know this. I do know this about gardening. You don't start with the fruit. You start with a seed. You start with a seed, and that seed gets buried <clears throat> deep down in the dark, and it gets all kinds of things put on top of it. And it spends a lot of time down there being buried, taking in what it needs. And a lot of that initial growth isn't even seen. So if you can't see joy now, it doesn't mean that it's not there. Joy has to be cultivated. So we're going to look at a parable today, which is a story that's found in three of the four Gospels, which is basically those are the accounts of Jesus' life while he was here. And at this point, there are so many, gather, so many people gathering that Jesus has gotten into a boat and he's like pushed off on the lake. And so he's talking to the people on the shore, which is maybe why it starts like this in Mark 4. He's like, listen, <laughs> can y'all hear me? I just need a little space from you. Some of you are rubbing off on me and I needed to stop. <clears throat> he's like, listen, 
A farmer went out to plant some seed. Now pay attention to where the seed lands. As he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath and birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants, so they produced no grain. Still, other seed fell on fertile soil, and they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as has been planted. Then he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. And I love that last verse because actually what happens in the next couple of verses is the disciples wait until everybody goes away and they're alone with Jesus and they're like, hey, so we know you said like if we have ears, we should hear and understand, but like we really don't. <laughs> so can you explain us to us what all this means? And so he does. But before we get into that, I want to tell you this is not a passage. It's typically used, not typically associated when we're talking about joy. Okay, so if you want to go back and read this for yourself, I encourage you to do so. I encourage you to ask God and be like, hey, what was Jesus' point here and what are we supposed to get out of this passage? But when I was reading, I saw it differently. I saw these different types of terrains as different seasons in our lives in different ways that we can cultivate joy. So if it's okay with you, we're going to just turn the gem on this passage a little bit, look at it a little bit differently, and see what new meaning God is going to reveal to us. So Jesus explains in verse 14. He says, The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. And in this case, the seeds are seeds of joy. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. See, I see this as a season of surface-level joy. This is when we have things that should make us happy, things that should bring us joy, but they're not real. There's no depth. There's no growth. And so it's really easy for Satan to come in and just pick them right up and take our joy away. Often, these are coping mechanisms. These are the things that we're using to numb out and forget that we don't actually have real joy in our lives. It could be overeating oversleeping, sleeping with the wrong people, over drinking, over medicating, over spending, over gummying. I feel like that's one I add to the list now, right? <laughs> over gummying. Now, not all of these are bad. Food, sleep, medication, obviously all have a place and they in themselves are not bad, but this is not where our true joy is found. And I think even if we can convince ourselves in the moment that they do bring us happiness, we know afterward that it's not true when we find that we feel even worse afterwards. The second terrain in verse 16 says, The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. We're like, yes, we're going to take this in. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. To me, this is a season of shallow joy. This season wants to grow. It wants to have joy. It's trying really hard, right? And it understands that the seeds are going to make it. They're going to make it underground, but barely. It's a real shallow depth. I think in this season, you know what joy is. You know where it's supposed to come from. You know that it should come from God, but there's some disconnect between your head and your heart, and you never actually internalize it. So when something comes along, when it gets hot, when there's rocks in your way, when that next thing doesn't pan out, there's nothing to keep your joy rooted. There's nothing to keep you in place. So whatever is trying to grow just kind of dies out. The third terrain in verse 18, says the thie- Jesus continues explaining, the seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things, so no fruit is produced. See, to me, this is a season of stagnant joy. 
a season of stagnant joy. It almost is like Jesus is like, you're a happy Christian when you're a happy Christian. Like you got it, but then you don't got it. You know that you should be rooted in God. You know what true joy looks like. You might have even, before this season, had seasons where you grew, you matured. You'd even been happy in the Lord and being rooted in him. So when something comes along, you're not necessarily uprooted. You don't exactly come out of your place when trials come, but you're not producing anything good either. You're not producing any fruit. You're there, but you're just kind of stagnant because you've forgotten that God is actually the source of your growth, both for your own internal spiritual maturity and in the fruit that you outwardly produce. You know what you're supposed to do, but you're not doing it. And maybe that's why you're not seeing the fruit of joy growing in your life. So there's one terrain left. This is the good one. We're going to park here for a minute. In verse 20, he says, And the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much had been planted. This is a season of sowing joy. The parable that Jesus told is often referred to as the parable of the sower. This is a season of sowing joy. This is a season of growth and multiplication, of cultivating joy that produces fruit. So how do we do it? That's the question, right? How do we navigate our way through the birds and the thorns and the distractions and the hard seasons? Well, we're going to sow it. And the first place that we have to sow seeds of joy is into our own soul. We have to sow seeds of joy into our own soul, and we have to sow perspective and resilience. The first thing that we have to do is change our perspective. We have to start by moving our focus away from the soil to the sower. Our perspective has to change from the soil to the sower. We have to figure out a way to move and see beyond everything that is trying to bury us, to see that this season is actually part of a bigger story. In John 15, Jesus, again, he says, this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Ready? I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be, what? Complete. I have told you this so that your joy may be complete. You want a joy that's complete? You want a joy that's not elusive? We have to start here. We have to start by being rooted in God's love, a love that is bigger than any tough season, a love that remains when the love of everyone else goes away, a love that truly loves you so unconditionally, it just wants the best for who you are and your life, a love that does not care what is currently growing in your garden or in your season, because it's the love of a perspective that sees so much more. We have to be able to pull back and remember there have been other seasons. There have been other things that were produced. And whether you're in an easy, good season or you're in a hard one, this season will still pass and another one will come. See, I tend to think of myself as a relatively positive person. I think I, you know, I try to exude happiness and joy and all of those things, but I'm going to tell you, I could just as easily tend towards cynicism, but this is a choice that I make, I would say every day, most days, <laughs> I'm just going to be honest, 
but it is something that I have to remind myself. I have to remind myself that being happy, that having joy is a choice. And so I have to choose not to be overwhelmed by what is burying me. I have to choose to have God's perspective to see not only what seasons he has already brought me through, but what seasons he is going to take me through in the, in the future. Not only what I have produced in the past, but what I will produce again if I stay rooted in him. And it's not about choosing just to have more faith over fear. It's not even about choosing positivity over negativity. It's choosing to remember that God is in control. He can see what I can't. And because he is in control, I don't have to be. I can let go. See, it's the same things that threaten to steal your joy that can also grow and cultivate it. It's the exact same things. It all depends on how you look at it. And then our perspective leads to sowing resilience. So your perspective and your resilience are connected. Does anybody know this verse in James? It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Consider it joy when you face trials, all the trials, joy. Really? Will anybody admit that you don't like this passage? A couple, couple honest people in here, okay? I don't like this passage. Do you know when I really didn't like this passage? Yesterday, when I somehow managed to delete my entire message from all of my technology. The whole thing, guys, yesterday, like yesterday afternoon. Sat down, was about to save it to all the places. I'm so good about saving and backing up and all that. I was just about to do it, gone. Every single word, no backups. No nothing fancy. God. And I'm going to tell you what. My faith was being tested. And it felt like a trial. And you know what it didn't feel like? Joy. <laughs> there was no joy. There was no happiness. And so I lost it. And I mean not just my whole message, but like I lost it. All the liquid in my body came straight out through my face. Lost all my joy, all my confidence, all my calm, all my peace. I did have a few words, not the words that are like back in here today, a few words that were so let stay in yesterday. Which, by the way, if at any point today you're like, this message makes no sense, you know what? Consider it joy, okay? <laughs> Consider it joy. You're like, is that even in the Bible? Consider it joy. You just look it up later. Consider it joy. Consider it joy. Okay. But what does that mean? What does consider it joy even mean? It doesn't mean call it joy. It doesn't mean name it joy. It means can you consider joy in this situation? Can you turn it, look at it from a different perspective? Some translations, instead of the word consider, actually use the word count. Count it all joy, which is a Greek accounting term that not even Google could help me pronounce, but I think we have it for you guys to put up on the screen. It's an, it's an accounting term. So if you'll permit me to switch metaphors really quick, we're going to go from gardening to banking, but we won't stay here long because I'm really not good at math and numbers. <laughs> but it's almost like what James is saying is think about this as a deposit, not a withdrawal. Think about this, consider this, count this as a deposit, not a withdrawal. Think about what's being invested in the middle of this trial. Think about what you'll have later on because of what's being deposited now. As I yesterday went back to my notes and all the things and I tried to piece all of this back together, this passage jumped off of the page to me. And I was like, I will consider it joy tomorrow. <laughs> but I felt like really God was saying to me, hey, are you going to practice what you preach? Are you going to live out these things that you're saying to everybody else? Are you going to let me test your faith? And will you trust me to produce perseverance in your life? Resilience is another choice. And I know that some of you are going through much bigger things and much harder seasons. And it would be so easy to say, I didn't choose this. 
I didn't choose this. I didn't choose this loss. I didn't choose this season. I didn't choose this situation. What happened to me? What was done to me? I know. But you still have the choice. How will you see the situation? Will you give up and give in? Or will you allow it to make you a more resilient person? Can you choose to say, instead, this is a hard thing, and it hurts, and that's real. But I will get through it, and just maybe I can learn something, and just maybe I can become stronger and become the best version of myself. Maybe one day I can find joy in this growth, even though it hurts right now. And just maybe God will get the glory because he will show up and do something that I cannot. This will pass. Sowing resilience into your soul allows us to move forward as we trust his perspective. All right, so now we've sown, we've sown uh, joy into our souls, right? Now, I think that was the hardest part. Now we get to move into what I think is a little bit more fun, and we get to begin to sow joy that produces fruit. So next we're going to sow joy into situations. And we're going to do this with fun and celebration. Sounds a lot easier than the things that we just talked about, right? Fun and celebration. Annie F. Downs, anybody an Annie F. Downs fan? Annie F. Downs is an author and a podcaster, and her show is called That Sounds Fun. And so she's constantly asking people, what sounds fun to you? What sounds fun to you? And I heard her explain once why fun matters so much to her, and she said that fun and joy are not the same thing. They're not the same thing. That joy is the thing that you feel, but fun is the thing that you do. So if you're looking for joy, you should chase fun. She understands that joy follows fun. When is the last time you sowed fun into a situation? Believe it or not, I've actually been told that I have a very high tolerance for fun, meaning I can intake a lot of fun. I can do things that are seemingly loads and loads of fun, but I have a hard time calling it fun. Like the next day after a big event, the conversation you know might be, oh my gosh, that was amazing, wasn't it? It was so fun. And I'm like, yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's cool, that's great. Yeah, everybody was there, we ate food, we dressed up. Like, but fun? I don't know. It takes like massive, massive amounts of fun for me to call something fun but I think I have to learn how to change this. I think some of us have forgotten how to have fun. I've been in conversations with people where you can tell that they think something's funny and they're like stone-faced. Have you been in conversations with people like this? You're like, why aren't you? I know, that was a hilarious joke. I can tell by your eyes that you think it's funny. Like, you're turning red, but why won't you laugh? Why are you doing, why? What are you doing? Stop that. We have forgotten how to have fun. And maybe you've been told it's childish, it's silly, it's immature to have fun. So you build up this persona so everybody knows like, that you're serious and you're smart and you've got to be taken seriously. But I think that we're missing something when we, when we allow our lives to, to go that way. Can I propose that when we refuse to sow fun into situations, we're back in that parable. We're back in the place where the birds are coming in and just eating up our joy. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus again says, the thief comes only to steal the sheep, that's us, and to kill them and to spoil them. I have come so that people may live and that they may enjoy life to the full. Not just have it. Enjoy it. Enjoy life to the full. Do you know what can't be present for me to enjoy life to the full? All of the things that keep me from having fun. Shame, regret, fear, doubt, insecurity, comparison. Bye. Bye. We need to kick those things out of our lives because they're stopping us from sowing seeds of fun. So what sounds fun to you? What sounds fun to you? Is it watching cat TikToks? Is it dancing in public? Is it breaking out into British accents in the middle of conversations? 
What is it? What sounds fun to you? Is it wearing loud, obnoxious clothing? <laughs> what is it? What sounds fun to you? Is it taking that part of you that you've pushed down because people have told you it was extra and too much? Baby, let it out. Let's go. We need to sow seeds of fun in our lives. Don't let the enemy stop you from having fun because he knows what you're missing and he knows that fun leads to joy. To keep that from happening, we're actually gonna take fun to the next level and then we're gonna sow seeds of celebration. We're gonna sow seeds of celebration. I've also been told actually that I don't celebrate well. I think I need different people in my life. <laughs> I think maybe that's why I'm having a hard time finding joy sometimes. I gotta find some new friends. <laughs> But it's true, I've been told that I don't celebrate well, and I'm like, what are you talking about? I love celebrating people. I love celebrating people. I love that we're celebrating Pastor Jean today because today is his actual birthday. But no, I was told you don't celebrate well. You love fun and you love people, but you don't love celebrating. And if there's any kind of achievement to be had or success to be made, if there's any kind of win column, you don't celebrate well, and that's true. Maybe you can relate. I've been thinking about why this happened. What did you grow up celebrating? Did you grow up celebrating birthdays, holidays, maybe some major milestone things? At some point, something happened, and our celebrations, I think, turned into like just expectation, the expected, just the, the given next step. Like, oh, you graduated high school, good job. Where are you going to college? Okay. You got into college, that's good. That's what you're supposed to do after high school. Oh, you graduated college, that's awesome. Okay, yep, as expected. Oh, you got a job offer, awesome. Well, when do you start? All the logistics. We're not gonna, we're gonna move right on past the point that this is actually a big deal still. Oh, you got engaged, yeah, most people do. Oh, you're pregnant? Oh, okay, yeah, that, that typically happens, like after you get married. Have you ever heard this phrase? You act like you're the first person to have ever experienced this. Uh, well, it's the first time I've ever experienced it, so I would actually like to celebrate this. I think this is actually a big deal. Maybe this is never gonna happen to me again. See, what has happened is we have learned to minimize, 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 minimize. And we've taken all the awe and the wonder and the excitement out of everything until life is just what it is. Nothing is a big deal. Nothing is worth the hype. Now, I didn't want to create that kind of world in my family, so I go, I've gone the complete opposite direction with my children. <laughs> I celebrate everything. We celebrate every single thing. Yesterday, Margot tied a bow on her dress, and I was like, you're amazing! <laughs> like, who taught you how to do that? That's incredible! Marley! You ate over your plates, baby, we're so proud of you. We celebrate everything. And I've had people say to me, aren't you worried about creating like spoiled and entitled kids if you celebrate everything they do? No way, no. Because guess what, the world is gonna come for them as soon as it can to tear them down and tell them what's wrong with them and it is my job to make sure that they are rooted in the love of Christ and they know that they are worth celebrating. Can you imagine what life would be like if we all started celebrating again? We try to do this at Mosaic. Again, we're celebrating Pastor Sean today and you might have noticed when you've been here, there's like, like a vibe right? It's kind of an unwritten rule of fun. We don't take ourselves too seriously, but we also try to be intentional with celebrating. We start our meetings with good stuff, which is a very technical way of saying like, what's good stuff that God's doing in your life, be it at Mosaic or in our lives personally. Then after we've talked about that, then we move to the hard stuff. Because it's a great practice of gratitude, but we also know that if we don't celebrate before we critique, if we're not intentional about celebrating, it won't happen. It won't happen. And without celebration, we will create a world that is mundane and common and expected. We will miss 
all of the places and all of the times in our life where God is doing something amazing. But instead of being captivated by it, instead of celebrating it, we're just like, yeah, again, okay. We have to be people who celebrate so that we don't become people who are disenchanted or hardened or critical. Sowing celebration into situations allows us to possess joy now and break out of the constant strive toward the next. Lastly, we get to sow into relationships. So we've sown into our own souls. We've sown into situations. And lastly, we get to sow into relationships. That's what this whole with series is about. And um, the first thing that we're going to do in relationships is we're going to sow compassion. Brian Stevenson is the founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative. He also wrote the book Just Mercy that was turned into a movie, and he does a lot of human rights work. And Brian says that proximity is the path to compassion. Proximity is the path to compassion. If we want to be people who are compassionate, we have to be willing to be with people. And this is not sympathy. This is not pity or feeling bad for someone. Those are the kinds of emotions and feelings that allow us to stay removed from the situation. Compassion gets us close, close enough to sew in, close enough to rub off on these people. It's why you can be sad when you see the orphans on the screen, but you're never actually moved to action because you've stayed removed. You're not in relationship with those families. Have you noticed, at least on my social media feed, there are a lot of people with a lot of opinions right now. A lot of opinions on, I want to call it political issues, even though they're just issues that have become political, but I think y'all know what I'm talking about without me getting into specifics. So many opinions. And it seems as though most of the people whose voices are the loudest aren't actually doing anything to make a change for this platform or their viewpoint that they are so excited about. They're not actually doing anything to help the people, but they seem to be so passionate about. And I'm like, where is the disconnect here? Why are there so many voices and so many things being said, but so few things actually being done? Could it be that these people are not in relationship with anyone that is actually being affected by these issues. There's a difference between sitting with people and just getting hyped up by our emotions. See, proximity is what changes the world because proximity will change us. It will make us compassionate people who are willing to be with people, to sit with people, to hear people, to listen to their stories and their perspectives, willing to see how issues affect them that don't affect us. And I promise you, if you sow compassion into a relationship, one person, ask God, maybe he'll even bring that person to mind. If you can sow compassion into one relationship, you make that person feel seen, heard, loved, cared for, I promise you, joy will follow compassion in that relationship. Lastly, we have to sow generosity into our relationships. We have to be generous people and generous with so many things. I know the easy ones come, right? Like our money and our resources and our time. Yes, you also have to be generous with your opportunities, your invitation, your inclusion. Be generous with how you use your voice and your influence and your privilege for people that maybe don't have it. Are you generous with your grace and your forgiveness? Allowing, making allowances for people's faults and for their humanity. Are you generous with humility, compassion, submission? Do you ever let the other person win? Do other people ever get to have the last word? We have to be generous with the space we take up. See, generous people can't be narcissists. 
They can't be people who make it everything about them. We also have to be generous with our choices. Yes, going where other people want to go and doing what other people want to do, but also up here. We, are we generous with other people with our choices? Do we care what other people have to say? Do we care? Are we generous in hearing about other people's hurts without coming in with our own and going, yeah, that must be hard. Do you know what happened to me? Same thing with accomplishments. We have to be generous in honoring other people. That's so cool for you. Do you want to know what I did? Boop, 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 boop. No. Let's be generous with other people. See, this parable to me is really about God's generosity with us. God is the sower in this parable, and he doesn't seem concerned at all with where the seed lands. He doesn't seem to be concerned about what terrain it lands on, what's going to grow, what's not going to grow, what we're going to cultivate, what we're going to neglect. He doesn't seem to care. He just keeps opening his hands and flinging it out in abundance. He's not withholding anything. He's like, seed over here, seed over here, seed over here. All the seasons, all the terrains, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to keep giving it to you. It's almost like he knows that the more we sow, the more we'll grow. What are you clinging on to? Because you're afraid that if you actually do become generous with it, there won't be enough for you. Is it love? Is it opportunity? Is it forgiveness? Is it grace? Is it salvation? And what if you could learn to open your hands and let go? If you believed that there was enough to go around, how differently would you live? How different would the world be around you if you stopped letting uh, your generosity be controlled by fear or anxiety, scarcity mentality, and we began to just sow seeds of joy. We might actually have to be like Jesus and get in a boat and go out on the lake because there's going to be all kinds of people wanting to come and be in relationship with us. The choice is yours. Will you pursue happiness in the next or possess joy now. Now I want you to, I'm going to wrap up, I'm going to pray for us in just a second, but I want you to ignore that voice that right now is telling you, oh boy, she just gave you a lot of to-dos. I did not. Remember John 15, your joy is already, what? Complete. Your joy is already complete. Ask God to show you in what area of your life you need to cultivate joy. And if you don't see the fruit, if you don't see fruit right now, remember that it starts with a seed. And just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. And if you're in a season that all of this still feels impossible, you're like, I really got stuck on that whole count it all joy and trials thing. Can I suggest to you that maybe today is the day that you look for real lasting joy in the midst of your season, in the midst of how you're feeling and just ask God to show you what that looks like. It doesn't matter if it's the first time you've asked him or if it's the hundredth time you've asked him. Just ask him to show you, God, what does your joy look like right now in my life, in my season? And it may look different than anything you've ever expected. God's joy often does not come in with confetti cannons and noise and all the things that we expect in celebrations. But it's a sense of calm. It might be a sense of peace. Not because all of your burdens and all of your trials have disappeared, but because that's what the supernatural love of God can do. He can come in and fill you with such a sense of joy that cannot be explained away any other way. And that is available for you today. All you have to do is ask him, tell him, that you are willing to be rooted in him. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you, Lord, for this message. God, I thank you for, um, God, your words. God, that this was truly a message that you had for people today. And so, Lord, first and foremost, I'm just honored and humbled, and I just thank you, God, for the opportunity to be here talking to people this morning. God, I know 
that this message was specifically for them. And so God, I thank you that they're here. I thank you for the people that are watching online. Lord, and I pray that whatever the one thing is that you had for them to hear this morning, God, that it would root in their hearts. God, that it would stick with them when the service is over, when they leave wherever they are right now, God, and that you would remind them of your truth and your joy. God, and I pray that you would give them courage and resilience to go after it, God, until they truly find themselves rooted in you. God, we thank you for how you love us. And we thank you, God, that, that your love and your joy is different than anything else we've ever experienced it. In your name we pray. Amen.